Okay. All right, fabulous. I think we're live on all of our platforms now. Welcome. It's Thursday. It's another round of KSAC Connections. And so I decided to bring in the crisis team lead, Jocelyn. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? I'm fabulous. So Today, I want to, you know, I've been talking to Peyton, who uh, is doing our flow group session. And so, you know, we have so many groups available at KSAC, and we also have counseling and group counseling. And so I kind of want to talk with you because I know once the new year and, new, and the school year starts, you're going to be more involved with our groups. Yeah. And so I think when I think about, healing after an assault or healing after trauma the first thing that comes to my mind if I can keep myself organized here is <laughs> um <laughs> is you know getting a counselor going to a therapist having those conversations but that doesn't work for everyone so I guess for you why does group work work for some people yeah, um, I think that's a really good point that you mentioned is that certain things are not going to work for everybody. And I think that that's really important, even when you're still talking about group research is recognizing the individual differences still within the group. Um, for a lot of people, it's kind of reassuring and comforting to know that there are other people out there that have experienced the same or similar things, who are going through the same emotions, who are feeling the same things and it can be really helpful to talk to and bounce ideas off of people who maybe have a bit of a better understanding of what you're going through. Um, it's obviously really good to have supportive people in your life and I think it's great if you have someone you can talk to in that sense but I think that there's an added sort of addition to the healing process when you are able to be in a group with people who have that better understanding of what you're going through and who can kind of understand on a deeper level and help with that healing process because they themselves are going through very, very similar emotions, feelings, strategies, all of that sort of stuff. So like adding another level to it by knowing that like you're not alone and kind of having that actual concrete evidence of, I think sometimes when people are going through the healing process after going through trauma and assault, it can feel like like why did this happen to me like I am the only one kind of feeling that and so groups don't take away from that they don't say like oh no you're just one of this many they recognize that you're going through this but here's also people who understand you and hopefully you can kind of connect with on that deeper level than you might be able to with you know a family or a friend mm -hmm. It, especially in a small town, you know, we saw how impactful the Me Too movement was. And just even a, a tweet or just saying something like, yep, this happens to me too. It's, it's such a unifying experience. And it, you almost like create like a family from that, right? With sexual violence, like so much of it is what we see in the media is victim blaming, right? Like, why were you... Um, you know, why were you walking alone at night? Why were you doing this? And it really, it puts doubt and it puts the onus on the victim for their own trauma. And so when we have survivors come to our center, one of the things they tell one of our counselors is you're not the first person that I've told about this. And that I've told other people about this experience, but whether I wasn't believed or I was laughed at, it hindered my ability to even think about this as a trauma because I thought that I caused it. Yeah, for sure. That idea that like, I mean, it's awful, but it happens so much and it's not talked about enough that society just is, victim blaming is something that's become so like normalized in society and it, it's not. And, you know, it's really unfortunate because sometimes people disclose trauma to people and yeah, they are not believed or they're laughed at or even people just don't know what to say. So the way that they react kind of falls on that victim blaming because 
they don't even know what to say. Like that's what they know about sexual assault and sexual violence. So, you know, if that's all that you're used to, then it can be really hard to feel like I can tell other people and like maybe other people have gone through the same thing because if you're constantly told like, no, no, I'm, maybe it wasn't what you thought, then it can be really hard. Mm-hmm. And so um, with groups, I know at KSAC, we have a variety of groups, whether it's mood walks or journaling or thinking and learning about trauma as like an educational framework, right? When we learn that the way that we react to trauma is biologically innate it's our survival mechanism right the freeze flight fawn response where sometimes we have to love the person who's harming us in order to lessen or stop that harm it it validates you so we we have that group um we have expressive arts which has kind of moved online we have storytelling we have flow we have trauma-informed yoga and so it's really a, a beautiful experience when we bring everyone together and just talk about what has not necessarily what has happened, but talk about it. What has happened like as a, as a community in a way, as um, identifying that this is something that happened to you, not something that you caused. Right. And I think groups give you that opportunity to talk about it in different ways. If you're in a group and you want to talk about what has happened to you, you know you're surrounded by people who are going to believe you and on some level understand what you're going through better than other people. But if you're not comfortable sharing your story, exactly, you can still talk about it in more of a sense of why is society this way? Like, do you guys believe kind of the same thing? Or, hey, I've tried this coping mechanism. I really didn't find it worked. Has anyone else felt the same thing? And what have you guys done? Bouncing ideas off of each other. So it doesn't just have to be about disclosing. It can be if that's what you want, but groups I think are really important for all of those other things as well. You don't have to share your story with a bunch of people, but you can still be supported by them nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the the coping strategies, right? And like, and you know, what's great as well is that we have like, the thing with one-on-one counseling is that it's just that, it's one-on-one, but you and I both know that sexual violence is happening to a lot of people and not just one gender, although it definitely impacts one gender more than another, but getting into one-on-one counseling, it's, it's, it, it takes some time because, you know, it's one person versus the hundreds The I think we served 700 clients last year with one-on-one counseling, right? Like, and there's only what, 365 days in a year. So like, yeah, that's a like it's it's a lot and it's a lot of work, especially for historical trauma, where it's not just going to be a one and done session. Mm-hmm. And with certain rollbacks and cutbacks that the government has put in place, um, it it just it limits the the survivor to even think and talk about. So I feel like, um, well, sorry, think and talk about within those limited number of sessions that you have. And so groups allow you to think about your trauma in a different way before having to think about your trauma and then think about you it's kind of it kind of like oversteps that first step in a way with the groups right totally I agree with that it's like it it gives you like an extra thing like you could still be searching out for individual counseling at some point but it kind of gives you the opportunity to explore your options a little bit more and maybe explore just your emotions and feelings in general as well before kind of diving more into the very, very specific personal things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it, it's a a great kind of general introduction to kind of whatever, right? Like if you're talking about mood walks, like I volunteered for that back when, back when I was a volunteer and I worked (laughs) my way up to public education, but the mood walks was really impactful because it just, it's something that we do every day. We you know, most of us do every day. We, we get out and we, we have a walk or we're at least walking somewhere, whether it's in your home or walking, you know, out and about just taking that moment to like, just focus on every step that you're taking. How does that feel on the ground? What part of your feet are touching the ground? It's an incredible experience to just think about something so mundane as having this deep 
and profound impact. Yeah, that I what I love about I mean, my research, a lot of it has been in mindfulness. So mm -hmm. anything to do with mindfulness, grounding, those sorts of things is, I'm always interested in that. And I think that that can be really good in a group as well. Because again, it gives you that room to kind of bounce ideas off of each other or discuss it because mindfulness or, or even laugh, even laugh and fail. Right? It, and you don't have to enjoy every single part of it either. If one part you're like, you know, I love nature walks, I love the mood walks, I love being able to go through all those steps, great. But you're like, you know what, yoga just doesn't work for me. Talk to other people and see what they do. And so I think that's a really good way because I think that mindfulness stuff is not, you know, what our brains usually naturally do. We're so on autopilot all the time. Mm -hmm. So giving the actual space for people to explore that and talk to other people about it and try it and fail and try it and succeed is really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy just popped in. Tracy's the uh, crisis service coordinator just said, hi, Joss and Alicia. So grateful for you both. You know, Jocelyn and I, um, we would much rather not have a job here. We would <laughs> love for sexual violence to not be a thing. But I think what it comes down to and what I love about Peterborough and Ogojuan is that we really are a tight knit community. We really are a place that loves to support. There's, you know, it's definitely room for, for growing and, and learning. Um, but I've even talked to some of the, the mending guys about being out at a bar and there was an inappropriate comment that was made to the person working. And it was so nice to see just other people step up and say, no, 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 like not appropriate. And so, um, I, I want to hear more about your mindfulness research. Never heard about it before. I'm just kidding. We've oh talked gosh. about it a lot. But um, was there anything in your research that survivors can really learn from or something that you think connects to what we are doing here at the center? I think, I mean, a lot of my research was focused on um, attachment and mindfulness. So, I mean, that's kind of like a whole other bag of <laughs> research to unpack. And um work through, but I think what's important with research is always taking it with, with a grain of salt. I'm almost at the point of my defense, so I can't really definitively say too much, but a lot of my research found kind of associations between your attachment, so kind of how you view yourself and your own self-worth and how you view other people and support from other people can influence how mindful you are. So that's kind of like the base of what my findings were, but we don't really know what that's like on more of like a longitudinal scale. So it's not necessarily saying, you know, if you have poor relationships, you are not very mindful and therefore X, Y, Z is going to happen, mm -hmm. but just that there's a relationship there and understanding that more and maybe being able to go into a group session already kind of knowing like, this isn't usually my go-to. Mindfulness is not something that I fall back on immediately, but doesn't mean it's not something that I can learn because we know now from research that, you know, I can't speak much to the cultural aspects of mindfulness meditation. I think it's important to recognize that it does come from um, a more Eastern cultural background that I'm not well-versed in, but the way it has been Westernized we understand it as, yes, it's a trait that you kind of have a level of, whether that be high or low. So that's kind of where that comes from with your relationships. But there's a whole separate part of mindfulness, which is learning and practicing it. So just because it's not something that you naturally do or you've tried mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't actually try it and build that skill. It's like a muscle, like your brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we think about mindfulness and like meditation, how many times do we quit it before we actually start to get it on a very small, small, small amount? You know, there's time and time again that we, we go through and we practice. And after like two minutes, we're just, or after 30 seconds, let's be realistic here. Yeah. <laughs> after, after 30 seconds, we're thinking about, did I have lunch today? Mm-hmm. Did what I, else do I have to do today? Should I take a nap? How many hours of sleep would that be if I took a nap? How many hours did I get last night? How many hours should I fall asleep tonight? What time should I fall asleep at? 
what time should I get up at? And like, it's often, true. you know, it's, it's, it's time, but I think, you know, relationships are, are, are something that, that we can rebuild in a way. And I think groups really speaks to that and having other people around knowing that there is that, that deep connection that may not be overt, but you know that you're all survivors of a similar trauma, not that everything, uh, every single one is the same, but of a similar uh, type of trauma. It's, it's a really, it's a deep connection, deep binding moment. I think about um, one of the Netflix documentaries I watched with um, um, Jeffrey E. And mm -hmm. how uniting it was for the victims to all come to that court together and to say or oh even the um the gymnastics one yes we're all what was it 124 or was it like 400 it was like <laughs> an insane number that they all got to read their their impact statement and so it's they don't even know well some of them knew each other but like for the most part not all of them knew each other and so it's so unifying to to have everyone come together and to understand that like we're all victims but we're also all survivors and we can get through this and that some people are ahead on a certain pathway that's not linear by any means sometimes no. those pathways go backwards sometimes they're stairs sometimes it's a tornado <laughs> like but you know healing is not is not linear but just having everyone in that space is really liberating in a way yeah it it's awesome. And a lot of the research on groups, you know, has pointed out that like, it's maybe not perfect for people. Again, it's mm -hmm. individualized, you know, things work better for some people than others, but what's really important. And what I think KSAC does really well is having facilitators that recognize that and really focus on group cohesiveness. That's been shown to be something that helps groups succeed and stops people from dropping out prematurely or kind of saying this isn't for me is recognizing the group cohesion. So you all have a shared story in a sense, but you're still an individual. So you also do kind of have a say in your healing journey. So you are in a group and this is part of your journey, but you still kind of have your own path as well. So the group is there to help facilitate it, not to put everyone kind of in the same path or the same box. Mm -hmm. um, I think KSAC does a really great job of and the amount of groups, you know, there's not just one group program, there's a whole bunch of different groups and they all focus on different aspects. So you get a chance to kind of pick which one works best for you. And the thing with all of our groups as well is that they're all free. So if you mm -hmm. do one yoga session and you just, and you go and you absolutely hate it, it, the only thing that you have put out is just an hour of your time or two hours of your time, depending on the, the session, right? And so, and there's there's more to be be gained than, than lost from it. It's not a financial burden um, right. other than, you know, if you have kids and you're putting them through like in mm -hmm. care and stuff like that but um in, in terms of actually paying for the groups like it's it's not like you've paid once and now you have to attend all four to six sessions right like it's yeah. very much like I go to this group I didn't really like it that much I go to another group and this worked for me I I keep reflecting back to our expressive arts and when we had uh, some placement students that were part of it like there's there's some part of um our where it's all definitely individualized um but just laughing at the um the attempts at some of the yes. art and but not laughing at like laughing with and just it's but they said you know no matter how bad the art turned out i still enjoyed my time with everyone being there and creating something yeah it's awesome i've i've been lucky enough to go to a couple of them back when you know Everything yeah. was not crazy and online and um, got to go. And again, yeah, I mean, I think I just went and did art and talked to people, you know, even if we we're just having chats about just like life, you know, mm -hmm. just getting to like do that and have that shared experience with everybody was awesome. And it's just so nice to see people being able to get together and talk about whatever they need to and create things that are beautiful together. Mm -hmm. We even have uh, some storytelling groups that are going on right now where people are um, 
recognizing their story and and talking about it or creating some sort of creative um piece around it and so it's a a really beautiful group and i think the the best way to to figure out groups uh, with some groups like flow um the yoga mood walks you don't necessarily have to go to every single group you can definitely just drop in and then there's some other groups like the storytelling or um what was the seeds group about learning about trauma where it's it's a succession but i think that the best place to to go is to to email um KSAC, K-S-A-C at Nexicom, N-E-X-I-C-O-M dot net and ask, hey, I'm interested in groups. I'm not currently a client, but I am, I've, I've had experiences with sexual violence and, you know, I'm looking to, to, to learn and to, to grow and to heal. And I, I love that KSAC provides that space as, as well. Yeah, it's awesome. And again, it's kind of like, if you're, kind of just looking right now and you're not entirely sure how your healing journey is going to go or what is going to be involved in that and you just kind of want to test it out and get the chance to do these groups and get the chance to maybe just talk to and meet some of the staff or the volunteers online yeah. that you know it's really great that you have that option and it's free for you to just try out and kind of start to figure out what you want your journey to look like. Mm-hmm. And I love what you said about just getting to know the space. It's really, um, it's really, oh, what's that? intimidating to go to a sexual assault center as a, as a survivor and just knowing that you're going there for counseling and, yeah. you know, it's, well, first of all, like there's no judgment. Um, I you know, I don't get to see everyone, but like when I see people, it's just like, oh, hey, like, you know, welcome. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I, there, this is a, a space for, for healing and not everyone there is is going because they're a survivor, but um, there's this connection, this empathy, this um, feeling of, of hope as soon as you come off that elevator or come through the door. Um, I forget what our sticker is right on the, the front window. Um, but it's just about validation and hope. And I love that KSAC has kind of created that space, which, you know, we'll eventually be using, I yes. guess. <laughs> but uh, Jocelyn, thank you so much for, for coming on and chatting today. Is there any last words that you have, if there's a survivor out there listening that's curious about groups? Um, I know you're going to be a part of um, a lot of the groups coming up. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you wanted to say to them that are listening today? Um, I just want to say that you are strong. We here at KSAC believe you, and we also believe in your healing journey. So, you know, if you feel comfortable, take that first step in reaching out with an email. We've just launched the 24 7 crisis initiative. So, super easy to just go on text or online and you know it doesn't you don't have to be in a crisis situation you can just reach out and ask some questions about what we have and there will always be somebody there 24 7 to answer your questions and kind of help you maybe figure out you know if you want to start with KSAC or where you can kind of start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I love how we are so connected to a variety of resources here in this community. So, um, Jocelyn, you've also been part of the the crisis line and and answering those messages. Is everyone in crisis that is reaching out to you? No, I would say the majority of the time it is more just kind of inquiries and questions about whether it be KSAC services, services in the community, kind of hey, this kind of thing has happened, what should I be looking into? Or someone I know has had something go on, you know, what are some resources I can look at? That's a lot of the time what it is, is kind of just looking for connections to other resources and asking questions about the center or about other resources in um, the community. So. Oh no, it's frozen. <laughs> 